This episode of The Edge is brought to you by Audible.com, offering more than 180,000 titles for smartphone, tablet, and desktop. To get a free audiobook of your choice and help Trek.fm at the same time, visit audibletrial.com slash trek.fm. And also by Enterprise in Space, an international program of the nonprofit National Space Society. Find out how you can help science and education and become a virtual crew member aboard the NSS Enterprise Orbiter by visiting enterpriseinspace.org. And if you want to join the conversation and share your thoughts on this episode, join the Babel Conference, our listeners group on Facebook. Just type B-A-B-E-L into the Facebook search field. We look forward to seeing you there. You're listening to Trek FM. What have you done out there on the edge of Federation space? Hello, listeners, and welcome to another episode of The Edge. I'm your host, Patrick Devlin, and I'm joined once again by the the Emperor herself, Amy Nelson. How are you, Amy? I am doing great, Patrick. So back to be talking Star Trek Discovery with everyone. Yeah, yeah, it should be a good one. Uh, we're going to do another character profile. I've, I've been enjoying these a lot, actually, and they've been getting some pretty good uh, feedback as well. Yeah, and just doing a deep dive with just focusing on a character has been really interesting. I, it seems I'm enjoying Discovery on a whole different level, and I, I just love it. Yeah, yeah, it's definitely changing my opinion of uh, some of the things I thought before doing these, so it's good for me. We are joined by a guest today. We have John Krikorian. How are you, John? Doing super well, Patrick. Thank you for having me on. What a treat. Awesome, awesome. So you're going to join us today to talk about uh, Saru, but let's give a little background on, on him through the series. So we started out with... He was on the bridge, and he was obviously hostile towards Burnham, right? They butted heads in the beginning there, and it didn't make too much sense why they disliked each other to the degree. Then the whole um, backstabbing happens, the war starts, and when we see him next, he's on the bridge of Discovery, and he's blaming Burnham for the war, which kind of annoyed me because he was there. He saw what happened. But later on, he goes in to tell, tell about how the real reason he was upset was he never got the chance to be directly under George U, which kind of makes sense to me that I understood that. And, uh, and about his character, we see he has the fear ganglia. He, he gives his famous, I smell the coming of death speech and so on and so forth. Um, and as I don't want to get too much into his character, cause that's kind of what we're going to talk about. But as we go into the season, we, we learn more about the way his, his race is a prey and how that affects him and being in Starfleet. Um, what do you think of any of that, uh, Amy? We definitely get to see his arc of how his being brought up and his culture really affects who he is. Um, and I think that's really important because I think each of us, you know, how we are raised and, and with our culture and with what we're taught, like how that's going to affect our decision making. And and we see that he does. He he questions, is he going to be a good captain? How can he be like other captains? So I think he's very relatable that we get to question ourselves and the sort of our upbringing through Saru as we watch Discovery. And we get to see him go through how he deals with his fear and how he deals with his doubts and how he deals with his relationship with Burnham, you know, and I'm sure we'll get into it. But I really like that he is just very relatable, down-to-earth type of, of a character on Discovery that I think is unique and I don't know of any other character that's like Saru on Discovery. That's an excellent point because one of the things I saw in him is in a lot of the characters we've seen throughout Star Trek in general, they're they're mostly alphas. Mm -hmm. right? Even not the captains. They're, they're usually some type of alpha character. And for once, we have someone that's completely the opposite of that, which I, I found very interesting. Which really brings us to our first topic, and I'll, I'll ask John, uh, what do you think of this as a new species added in just for discovery? Well, I want to come back to one thing you said in a minute uh, in your introduction there, but as for Saru's introduction, I thought it was just great that they put up a character that had a background which was very much something which was unexpected and very different from what I think has been typical in the past. I mean, if you look at 
the idea of the Vulcans, you know, we have this race that's stronger than humans, smarter than humans, has all these additional powers. And, you know, there's all these other kinds of alien races that we come across that are, that are very just, uh, I don't know, that, that sort of put humans into like a backseat sort of way in a lot of ways. And we have this other character who doubts himself, uh, which I think is the biggest thing that he brings to the table. You know, you have this character who has some self-doubt. Uh, you know, the, the only other character I can think of off the top of my head that, that has that would be Barkley, maybe. Um, you know, regular recurring character anyway. And uh, I just thought that that was a really nice idea. And... Um, but two things I want to say. First of all, uh, I just got to preface this whole conversation by saying that any thoughts I have of Saru are going to be colored by the fact that I read the Desperate Hours book, which uh, if you people out there haven't read it, it really gives a lot of good backstory on Saru because you, you get access to his internal thoughts. And so that has affected, I think, my interpretation of him in the show. And the other thing I want to say is I want to come back to something you said, Patrick, which is you said he has a hostile relationship to Burnham. And I challenge on that. I don't think it was hostile. I I took it as like an annoyed brother-sister dynamic uh, more than more than hostility. Um, but I'm happy to be challenged on it. Hmm, interesting. Uh, I didn't I definitely didn't see it that way. I, I saw it as more um, hostile. But then again, I also started reading the Desperate Hours book and didn't finish it. So maybe in the end there, it changes my opinion. Well, and I can see where you're coming at, John, because like in that first episode, you know, and, and they're trying to figure out what is this, you know, unidentified object, UFO, I guess. Uh, and, you know, and and Giorgio's like, well, what is it? Well, we can't really find. And so then Burnham goes over to the console and sort of squishes him out of the way, you know, and they sort of have that give and take that sort of is like a brother sister you know, type of relationship that she's like, well, I can tell you what it is and I can tell you what it isn't type of thing. Um, I think that interplay between them uh, sort of sets up a friendly competition. Uh, I think it's more competing. And I think as we learn, as you said, like Saru really wanted to be under Giorgio's wing and never had that opportunity because Burnham was always there. But I think that I think they're both, I think, in order to be in Starfleet, have that major competition, go get them, you know, go rise to the top attitude. And I think that is where we get that competing element in their relationship. Yeah, I, I'd agree with you. And uh, like I said, one more plug for David Allen Mack's book is that they deal with the moment where, without giving a lot of way, where Giorgio decides whether it's going to be Saru or Burnham, who's going to be the, the first officer and what the fallout of that is and how all that happens and what their thoughts are about it. And so sort of the origin of a lot of the stuff you're seeing in the, in the two prequel episodes, episodes one and two of discovery, I think is colored by the, what you read in the book. So, and I thought it just worked out really well. So I, I just want to say that like, I can't separate the screen Saru from what I read in the book. Cause I, I read the book right as the show came out. So the two for me are intermingled and I have a really hard time disentangling mm -hmm. them. Um, and I think that's the intent with these books that are coming out concurrently with the series yeah yeah i definitely totally agree you know i technically not canon but they they brought on um oh man i'm gonna forget her name uh, chris uh, kirsten buyer Kirsten, kirsten buyer there you go and they brought her on just so that these books would be accurate to you know you could they could be canon if, if they had to be mm -hmm. so i think they did a good job like i said i'm about halfway through that book now and i uh i definitely see where a lot of what we see later comes about mm -hmm. even just being halfway through which is great and um and it definitely it definitely shed some light onto how the rest of his arc continues and, and even how his he reacts because of what his race is and, and his you know predisposition to being afraid of basically everything yeah so can we talk about that <laughs> i i think you know Star Trek has always brought in uh, and has been known of being one dimensional with their alien races. Um, do you feel that Saru's race is still one dimensional? So I feel that it's possible that if we saw more of them, his race would be one dimensional, but he's not mm -hmm. because his, his, Moving up in Starfleet shows that he he obviously doesn't just succumb to the fear all the time. Otherwise, he would never be promoted. He, he there'd be no reason to promote him. So 
he can't he's not a typical character from a race we haven't seen before it's not this is what this race is here for it's here to shed this light on this part of human existence uh go get it you know what i mean that that's kind of what everything else was the vulcans were overly logical the klingons were overly warlike the romulans were overly sneaky and so on and so forth but and these are overly um fearful and they they felt like prey or they were prey that i mean that's what they are in their their uh on their home world but obviously he had to overcome that at some point to get to where he is now you know i think one of the critiques against star trek more broadly and you know i'm happy to be challenged in this by either of you but it's that whenever we deal with alien cultures and i would even say the federation to a large degree is that uh the the show has a tendency to treat them all as monocultures mm-hmm. You know, all the Klingons are alike, all, you know, and you'll, you'll meet the alien of the week and they say, we on the planet one, two, three are all about X, Y, and Z, you know, and there's no like opposing viewpoints. And uh, so we don't know what the other Kelpians are like. And if memory serves, the only other Kelpians we meet are in the mirror mm-hmm. universe. So I, I don't know if they actually count for anything uh, as far as this discussion goes. But I think that he definitely has to be a couple standard deviations away from the standard um, to have wanted to have left the herd because I, I got the sense that they're kind of herd animals mm-hmm. in a way uh, and and joined Starfleet. And I, I think that he is probably not typical of the Kelpian group if, if Kelpian is actually the name that just refers to his particular subspecies or refers to – I don't know if it refers to all the beings from his planet, including the predator types. I, I think that's not clear. So I, I hesitate to use that phrase but um i think for our purposes here that you know the other ones like saru i I think that he's probably quite different from them yeah um so about the mirror universe we're we're gonna get into that later so i don't want to get too deep into that but i do think what we see in the mirror universe does tell us something about what about the prime universe kelpians um i also think that kelpians is just a subspecies on the planet uh i could be wrong but for our discussions this time we'll we'll just use kelpians as okay. meaning there, just because it's easier to talk about throughout the 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 series itself, but uh, the discussion itself, I mean. Um, but I do believe that whatever the predator is on his planet, they're called something else, which I like because now we have this is the second time we have multiple species coming from a planet. We had it in Enterprise, right? Now we have it with with this planet where there's two species, or it's not. Uh, it's probably like the fourth time, right? Because we had a we had the uh, let that be your last battlefield where they are essentially the same, but they're opposite colors. We have this planet, we have the Zindi, and we have, uh, there was one other planet where one was subservient to the other and they were dying out. I forget what series it was from, though. So we, we are starting to see that more in Star Trek, which is good. Yeah, instead of that being just a monoculture, like you were saying. Correct. You know, because it, it, it serves its, its storytelling purpose if the, cult, if the race is all one culture, because you're not going to see everybody, right? So it makes it easier to tell their stories and shine a mirror back at humans, uh, at us, if they just make each race a p- one part of us. And then you put all the races together, you have a human. But it doesn't do good for good storytelling to have, you know, realistic storytelling if all Vulcans are just these logical beings who never lie. Like, that just doesn't make any sense. Mm-hmm. So... Well, I just have to say, I, I have a, I have absolute metaphysical certitude that on the, the board in the writer's room in Toronto or wherever the writer's room is for Star Trek Discovery, there's a story idea that has to say, we meet the predator species from uh, Saru's planet. I, I just, I know that that has to be something that they're definitely contemplating. Whether we ever get to see it, who knows? But I, I know that that has to be an idea that they, they have in the hopper. Yeah, they would have to. I mean, I, I would think they'd even have to give us the episode unless it get canceled in season one. But, um, who knows? Like you said, they might never get to it, but I would hope so. Um, and then about that, so tying this back to his season arc and his, you know seeing the new species, what do you think of him being that high on a a Federation ship? Being that he is, he does let fear control much of his decision making. Okay, John. Well, I was going to say, I, I think it, I think it's a valuable way to inform the decisions of the captain, right? Because when you look at how Starfleet ships operate, the the captains very often, and I think this is true across all the series in a lot of ways, 
Um, the only exception I can think of to this might be Jellico uh, in the in the TNG era, uh, where they they look for their officers for options. And I think that it is worthwhile to have an officer who gives you a, a logical course of action, an officer who gives you an emotional course of action, an officer who gives you a, a fear based reaction. And I think that having all that rolled into the burrito leads to a richer meal and uh, leads to some wise decision making. So I, I think it overall it's a good thing. Um, do I think that that makes? And I don't know if you want to talk about this later. I don't know if that means that Saru is captain material, but I certainly think that as the show starts, I think it's a very valuable contribution for Giorgio to have an opinion of Saru's type um, in the mix. Yeah, um, I see what you're saying, and I I do agree, and I'm going to go back to what you said earlier. I think uh, how Saru was raised and, and being this prey and having this fear really uh it sort of reminds me of season one and season two wharf you know i'm always going back to my tng roots but like wharf was always raise shields red alert let's go you know oh we can't let's trust fire them, at it you know and and i see that similarity where saru's like uh we can't trust anyone we need to you know defend ourselves we need to make sure and you know follow every rule and and i can just see this in saru and uh, it's going to be interesting to see how he matures into a, a better Starfleet, more typical Starfleet, well-rounded person if he does decide or if he is going to be captain. You know, I think uh, you're right that the captain does need to have and look at things from different uh, points of view and different angles and, and perceptions. So I think he definitely adds a great richness to the bridge crew. And uh, he is very important because there is, you've got to be afraid. If you're not afraid, you're going to be making mistakes, you know? Absolutely. It's it's kind of the, uh, and it, it's kind of the exact opposite of the captain we get of the discovery, right? Like I've said this when we went over Lorca, a lot of times he did things that should have ended up ending the show or ending the discovery at the very least because he would he wasn't afraid of anything and he would shoot first and worry about the consequences and everything else later whereas now we have a polar opposite as his number 1 which is which is Saru who's afraid of everything and wants to make sure everything crosses every T and dots every I and uh, I think that's a great dynamic to have although you know we didn't really see Lorca using him to his full potential but that serves a whole other purpose in the show. So, well, but you know, Patrick, I would say that that it's okay to acknowledge uh, for us, and I think for for Saru himself, to acknowledge that he has this uh, self preservation drive that's very much inherent in him. That's you know even well beyond what some other species have, including our own. But perhaps that he can elevate himself beyond that, right? And that's a very Star Trek message. Uh, that he's going to perform at a at a higher level and choose differently, uh, rather than just fall prey to the oh there was a pun fall prey <laughs> to the uh, uh, Pavlovian response of retreat uh, every time you know and I think that that's a very Star Trek message so I, I think that that's great so there's a thumb in the eye to all the people who say there's no Star Trek and Star Trek Discovery come at me bro <laughs> <laughs> so I like that. Um- because yeah, I, I don't really like the. There's no star. This is not my Star Trek movement, but um, but so okay. So moving past that though, we, you talk about his uh, basically his flight, fight or flight, right? That's what we're talking about. Yeah, and uh, he's definitely more flight than fight, but he he's learned to be somewhat fight. But he ha- he has the threat ganglia now. <laughs> I've said this on numerous occasions. It's like the most useless thing in Star Trek, and. Because he, he uses it, they use it for a plot point, but they don't use it when it would actually become the most helpful throughout the series. So what is your thought on this threat ganglia and how they've used it for him at least? I find it very inconsistent and therefore I have to feel like what you say. It's just this plot device where, ooh, here comes the threat ganglia. Well, how come it hasn't come out every single time? Like, I don't... I am a person that sees patterns and those need to remain consistent. And when it's not happening, 
it's very annoying because it's like, dude, what don't you sense this? Don't you, you know? And then when it does come out, it's like, oh, really? Now you're going to sense this? It, it was so inconsistent that I did not appreciate it. It was really cool the first time you saw it. It's like, oh my gosh, this is really awesome. <laughs> and, you know, and so I was like, this is going to be great. This is going to be an additional. Uh, you know, like Troy being empathic, you know, we can, she can sense things and uh, I'm not going to say that hers was always spot on. Cause we know the writers did not write her very well, but like, it's a tool for the captain to use. And if it was consistent, then it could have been a very powerful tool for anyone who knew Saru you know, that this is what he was feeling and sensing. So I I do agree that it was this plot device. I don't think it was used very well. It was really cool first few times, and then it just sort of fell by the wayside. Well, okay, so I'm glad you brought up Troy, because people always make the comparison that this is just like Troy's powers, and I vehemently disagree with everyone who says that. Okay. They built in a plot point to Troy's... um, powers for lack of a better word mm-hmm. that would make it not perfect mm-hmm. i mean she wasn't a true empath right. right she didn't she couldn't read minds so just because i can feel that you're nervous or that you're scared that's that that's not going to work every time because some people can lie to your face and not give off any kind of information that they are mm-hmm. if you could pass a lie detector test i gotta believe you can beat troy basically she's just a living lie detector test right mm-hmm. so it doesn't bother me when hers failed mm-hmm. But hers, but hers, but his is no better than I get nervous, the hair on the back of my neck stands up. Like, it's no better than that. It's only when he knows to be afraid that he's afraid, or if Tyler's in a shuttle pod outside the ship for some reason it worked once. Well, I I think that one of the things that we haven't gotten is any explanation of how this thing is supposed to work. Because I was, like Amy, I was trying to sort of figure it out in my own head, like in my head canon, how does this thing work? And... We see at certain points that it seems to really only be about threats to his physical person in a lot of ways. So, you know, like like someone said online, I was talking with somebody, and they're like, well, how come it didn't go off when he was around Mira Lorca all the time? I was like, because Mira Lorca wasn't going to eat him. Mira Lorca had no interest in harming Saru, right? He had other purposes. So why would Saru's threat ganglia be going off? But then at, at the other point, we – and I'm – I might be re- misremembering this, so correct me if I have it wrong, but I seem to recall at one point he's sitting on the ship and because Burnham didn't leave, his threat ganglia came mm-hmm. out. By what mechanism is that happening, right? right? Like, is I, I don't understand, like, like, besides short of any mystical explanation, how would he know mm-hmm. that? It, it I, I don't think they've given us any sort of consistent in-universe explanation for how this thing works. The only thing we know for sure about the threat ganglia is that they are hella tasty. <laughs> Yes, <laughs> yeah. At least in the mirror universe, right? Yeah. But, so no, but that's that's kind of my point. They they built up first off when he gives his his my race was created to sense the coming of death and blah blah blah, right? That gives you the impression that he can just sense death, right? And that should not just be to himself. That should not just be to his unit. It should be that he understands that war is coming or that a predator is outside. But then if that's true, then he should have known that when they saw the, the unidentified object in the first place. Right? But he doesn't. Then he, he does get it when um, she doesn't leave. So that doesn't make any sense because now it's as if any threat causes that to happen. He also gets it when... Um, uh, like I said, when Tyler's coming to the ship, he gets it. And that doesn't make any sense because he wouldn't know that's a threat. He wouldn't have any idea that was a threat. But yet, if that's going to be true, if those two times it's going to happen, then I would be one that would say that it should happen every time Lorca walks past him because Lorca is going to be his death if he doesn't keep it in control. Well, okay. All right. I'm going to make an attempt here at at trying to justify some of this. Like Lorca is from an alternate universe, which is entirely outside whatever evolutionary design uh, created the Kelpians. Whereas like for Voke, right, as Tyler, you know, that, that, that Klingon cloak on that guy is not perfect, right? It is not like absolutely, like there could be pheromones. There could be all kinds of very subtle things that he might be able to pick up. 
Got, I got you. But I mean, th- I, I can see something there. But the one I can't get my brain wrapped around is like, oh, Burnham didn't step off the ship under the shuttlecraft. Therefore, his threat ganglia comes out. That one, I can't see any mechanism short of mysticism for that one working. Yeah, it seems like it wasn't fully thought out I, to me that they just said, oh, let's give him this threat ganglia. Let's make it go when we want him to be afraid of something and to tell the viewer that this is bad and go. Like, that that just seems like how it was written to me. The only thing I liked about it, the only thing, is at the end when he gives the speech that he didn't sense death, it kind of rallied everybody. So, I mean, and that's really not even the, the ganglia that's working in that scenario, really, but... Well, and it was... I thought it worked well um, when Burnham calls him in to uh, sort of get the sense of Kitty, you know, the the creature what's its name oh the tardigrade yeah, the tardigrade yeah i still call it kitty um <laughs> <laughs> you know and and that was useful as well but by then it it was so inconsistent that i was like huh i don't know maybe i, I don't yeah, know should but I trust I, it yeah or? yeah but I thought that that was pretty smart of her. Again, like I said, if it was used properly, and and I think Burnham was using it correctly, you know, it's like trying to get the sense of Kitty. Um, you know, she was able to determine and gain information with the help of Saru. And she played it off poorly, and Saru got upset. But, you know, still that main purpose to figure out the intent of Kitty of the tardigrade was was spot on. Yeah, and I think it ties into that loose working theory that I had that it's it's not just like an all purpose something is wrong somewhere in the universe detector, right? But it's really about threats to his person in some way, you know, to him personally and and or you know to to his body or to his life in some way. Um, that that's the nearest I've been able to figure it out. Beyond that, I just throw up my mm-hmm. hands. I, I don't yeah. know. Yeah, and that that makes the most sense. I mean. Just to figure out something's going wrong in the Delta Quadrant would be horrible, really. But I don't know. It just they they just they put so much emphasis on it. Then it disappears. Then it pops up here and there. And then then all of a sudden at the end he gives the speech, which doesn't go doesn't correlate with the rest of the season. But I do like the the speech because he rallies the troops and it, it they're just so inconsistent with it that it's like get it together, guys. Just put this together and and let's let's move in whatever direction this thing is going to help and let's start using it for what it's going to help. Let's not just have it pop up here and there when it feels like. Yeah. So I got it. Yeah. And you know, it's, it's a, it's a blunt tool too. It, it doesn't tell us much more than there somewhere at some point there's danger somewhere around me. You know, it doesn't mm-hmm. tell us any more than that. Right. It's just a, it's a light. It's either on or off. It doesn't tell us what direction. It doesn't tell us where to look. It doesn't tell us what it is. It doesn't tell us how close it just tells us danger. Yeah. Right. Correct. So, but we, you know, we could be using him to go into negotiations and to, if they're hostile, he should be able to, to figure that out first. Right. I guess, I guess it depends on what you mean by hostile. Right. I mean, are they hostile to, to him in the moment? Right. Is he in mortal danger? Or, you know, if you're negotiating with the Romulans, the Romulans are not about, I'm going to kill you right now. It's about, I'm going to do a gambit to try to take over this quadrant of the galaxy. You're probably going to walk out of this room, but I'm going to try to get over on you, right? So if he's in that negotiation, I don't see the threat ganglia going off at all, even though he's in a room with people who are, you know, not uh, necessarily aligned with, you know, with him. True. So I, I, at least in my head, that's how it seems to work as near as I can figure. I, I don't know. I, I just am totally speculating on it. But but that's sort of my sense of it from what I've seen. Okay. So from there, I guess we, we can go to Pavo because this is the first time we see him actually the exact opposite. This is where he ends up feeling no fear for the first time in his entire life. And it basically takes him over like a massive drug and he doesn't want to lose it. What were your thoughts on this episode, these scenes, and his his need to try and hold on to that feeling? Uh, John, we'll start with you. So I had a really uh, – I, I don't know if anybody else had a reaction like this. But, but I took it to be a profound message of being free of addiction. And, and that just might be something in my own head. But I, I try to imagine – because like, I had a very close friend of mine who was, who was deeply addicted to a, to a very bad substance. And – he um, had a lot of problems in his life, and 
he was eventually able to get clean. And he talked about like that sense of euphoria he got when he realized it had been a year. And I, his name was Matt, and I don't think he's listening to this, but thinking about you, Matt, always love you, buddy. And, you know, he, he was able to do that. And I think that if you were someone like Saru, that you have this constant looming cloud of fear that, you know, it ebbs and flows, but it's always there. It's like this thing that has its, you know, hands around your throat 24-7. And just the idea that you could be free from it, I, I think that that would be incredibly liberating. I, I think that it would probably have an, an accompaniment of endorphins, you know, or whatever the Kelpian equivalent is. I think it would have a sense of joy and peace, which is uh, something that as humans, I don't think we could quite access in a way that someone who was evolutionarily created as a prey animal would have. Um, so I, I, I bought that. I think the episode had other problems, but but that little part of it, I, I bought it. I I'm still trying to wrap my head around the purpose of this episode. And I love what you said. And now it sort of makes a little bit more sense. But are we saying that the drug addiction was Pavo or that that's the what fear. gave him the release? You know what I mean? Because like, yeah, I you feel know, like Amy, I, he... Yeah, 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 yeah. He, I, I think it's both sides. Yeah, because it sort of seems to be both sides. And the only negative I see is like, well, he wants to stay out of his fear because he's been living with it his entire life. So here is this brand new experience, but he's willing to hurt those that he loves and works with in order to stay there. And I just sort of feel like that's the negative side, you know, if we go along that as, as a drug, you know? And so then I wonder, yeah, what was this on the planet that had this effect on Saru and why did it affect him more than the others? So I, I let me say one thing about this okay. and, and then you guys can have at me, but I think this is one of the parts that I alluded to in the introduction to this episode where I talked about that I can't separate what I see on the screen from what I read in, in David Allen Mack's book. Uh -huh. Because one of the things that's mentioned in the book, no, no spoilers, but th this is a plot point for Saru, is that Saru likes being transported. He, he goes into the transporter in the book any chance he gets. And this is only because you have access to his interior thoughts in the book. This isn't something you would see on the show. Mm -hmm. And the reason that he likes being transported is that once the transporter beam has you, you are invulnerable. You cannot be shot at with a phaser. You cannot be grabbed. You know, you are totally, completely invulnerable once the beam has you. And it's the only moment he has in his life where he has peace. Hmm. And that's in the book, and it, it describes in detail how this affects him and how this feeling, you know, is so pleasant for him and how he feels like he has this moment of freedom. And, you know, some people don't like the transporters. And, you know, we've seen plenty of examples of that from McCoy to, you know, tons of the characters in Enterprise. So I, I get that, you know. And so here's a chance for this guy to be free of that, right? And now you can decide, well, which side is the addicting side? And I think there's an interesting discussion to be had there. But I totally buy it that if you get the idea that this guy is afraid all the time, that now he doesn't have to be afraid, that would be a powerful motivator. And, you know, maybe for us, we would say, oh, no, you got to be loyal to your dudes. You know, you got to be, you know, you're, you're in Starfleet, man, do your thing. But, you know, that that's something that, that we sitting here don't have this evolutionary predilection and so I, I i bought it that like i said that one part because i agree with you amy there's other problems in the episode and i wish they had spent their quat lose on a different uh kind of show i think they could have written something that was a little more powerful mm -hmm. uh but but i did buy that element of it for sure okay so just a few things i'd like to add here i i had a few feelings about this episode one being that they it never pays off later. We never see anything about it, like him trying to get back to that that's feeling again. And we also never see. So okay, so we never we never get a payoff with him trying to get back. Right? They mentioned at the end of the episode how he he felt safe for the first time. And he didn't want to let it go, but we also don't really get an explanation as to what on that planet really did that. I know the Pavins just want to help people, but they're just spiritually okay with that. And then we leave that planet an episode later and never return kind of bothered me. And Patrick, isn't that the most Star Trek thing ever? 
<laughs> like where where was Alexander in all of Deep Space Nine? True, true. Where, where, where were like all these ulti- you know in ultimate power um, in- alien intelligences that we ran across in TOS like every third episode, right? <laughs> Who said come see us in in fifty billion years when you've evolved, right? And you know we we run across them every third or fourth episode. Um, it, it's the most Star Trek thing ever to to have like these you know massive things and then we we don't see them again. Now I will say that that's sort of against the whole idea of discovery that you know we have uh, we're supposed to have this heavily serialized show and maybe we'll see them again. But the show's not over yet, so I I, I hesitate to use that as a criticism because because we're not there yet. But Star Trek has done this time and time again in so many ways that. I think frustrate people who come who are just now getting into Star Trek and they're expecting because they're in 2018 sort of a 2018 sensibility out of the show that was made in either the 60s the 80s or the 90s of that continuity but I, I think there's a lot of that in Trek of never going back to stuff yeah and I, that would be a secondary for me be, but really the fact that we don't even see anything from Saru about it again bothers me because it was such a major thing in his life how do we not hear about it again Got, well, you know, just like I expected to see Kirk crying in his uh, Saurian brandy about uh, Edith Keeler. You know, we never saw that. Mm, true. So I have, I'm going back to this question. Why did it affect Saru so much more than the other characters like Burnham and, and Tyler? Like, is it because he w- he's a different race? Uh, is it because like his threat some ganglia that that fear sort of heightened other senses that Tyler and Burnham didn't have. Um, like I, I'm trying to get still wrap my head around this episode, and I'm coming to this conclusion. Would you agree or disagree? What do you think? So I believe that the reason why it affected him, and it, and I do believe it affected the other two, just not to the same degree, is. Because he has an evolutionary trait that the Pavins see as a negative. Something that they can do for him that would help him. Whereas Burnham and Tyler don't have that issue. My only issue is Tyler's got two personalities inside him and they didn't catch that. I know. Wouldn't that have <laughs> been cool? <laughs> that would have, that, yeah, but then we don't go to the mirror universe the way we do it. Then it screws up the whole show. But then... <laughs> Yes, that that's my only problem is they should have caught they if they catch that he needs to not feel fear, they should have caught that Tyler was Volk and that's the only thing that bothers me about that. Burnham makes complete sense why it didn't affect her too much. Although she has, you know, issues with with um you know, her upbringing and stuff, you know, not getting into the being forced into Starfleet when she wanted to go to the Vulcan Science Academy and everything else. Um but at this point she didn't know that Sarek sold her out for Spock who and all that stuff. The the one thing I'll say that I, I will have bitterness about if they f- suddenly forget is they've now established in that episode that Saru has like the mighty donkey kick of power and he can just like totally hoof kick someone like, you know, 50 meters yes. away. So and, and run it, you know, warp. 1.3 like on <laughs> on on the earth so mm-hmm. if if in the future we're in some episode where you know this all could have been solved if he did a sprint and they, it like it doesn't occur to anyone I, I will be very bitter about that and will be crying tears into my sorry and ale about that <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so isn't it interesting that this is the greatest fighting prey of all time well, with, that's why I said earlier, I was like, I can't wait to see the Predators, you know, because <laughs> yeah, they, right? they, they got to they gotta make the Klingons look like a bunch of lemurs. Right. You know? I mean, it's it's ridiculous how strong they must be if these guys with those powers huddle in a corner somewhere trying not to die. I, I'm thinking of like that. Uh, I'm thinking of like the Predators from the, you know, Arnold Schwarzenegger movie <laughs> or something. You know, they, they got to be like at that level, you know, it's like totally just terrifying. Yeah, so we don't. I, I think that we probably don't want to mess that with one in their back pocket. Yeah, we we probably don't want to mess with them. It's a good thing we never see them in TNG or D Space Nine or Voyager. Yep, totally agree. <laughs> so, um, and maybe that's because we end up wiping them out for them because we like Sor- Saru so much. But who knows? No, that's not a very Star Trek thing to do. <laughs> it's not, but whatever. <laughs> if, if you listen to enough Warp Five, you you'll hear I pray for killings on a regular basis. But <laughs> I I want to go. I'm- I'm sending you to the Tantalus colony, dude. You need some help. <laughs> I probably do. <laughs> Going back to something you said earlier, though, speaking of um, 
addiction. So I did have a, a bit of an addiction problem. I'm going to leave my throw myself out there right now, and I didn't see the fear as what he was addicted to, but the pavos themselves as the addiction, which is probably why I wanted to see him bring that up more later on. Because nice. when you have a substance issue, and I mine wasn't mine was alcohol. I quit drinking for ten years. Um, uh, I was young. I was stupid. I did a lot of dumb things, but um, I got better. Long story short, uh, I'm okay now. But for the first for a while, it was really hard to not get up, go to work, leave work, and go to the bar. Not go have a beer. Not go have a drink. It was really really hard, and it was something that consumed a lot of my thoughts and time. And for him to just find this drug that makes him feel perfect and great and wonderful and happy and not afraid of every little thing to just ignore that ever happened drives me crazy. Yeah. Because I thought about beer and, you know, Jägermeister as though it was the greatest thing in the world and it was killing me. He found something that wasn't killing him that was going to save his life. And he was just like, oh, I miss it so much. So we're going that way now? All right, we'll go that way now. Yeah, I think that um, I, I, I'm not sure this is a criticism. I, I, I don't know how I feel about it just yet, but I, I question the balance in the whole first season of Discovery between the thoughts and the interior lives of the characters versus like the action adventure element. I, I, I don't, I, I think what you're bringing up right here is like we didn't get enough of Saru's interior life as he's dealing with that, right? And I think in um, a lot of uh, previous Star Trek, we had a lot of that, you know? If you look at that whole Inner Light episode in TNG, right? It's all about Picard's interior life, dealing with this knowledge of this life that he lived in his head. And this whole discovery is so much – well, I don't want to say it's about, but it, it contains so much pew, pew, pew and engage the warp drive and, you know, fire phasers and all of that that I think that the balance – could be off, and I say could be very intentionally. I don't know how I feel about it yet, but it sounds like that's what you're saying, is that like you wanted to see more of Saru's interior life, and I think I would agree with that, um, certainly, uh, on, on on that level. I, I would have liked to have seen him dealt with that, too. Yeah, either deal with that or don't have this episode, but the way they did it kind of leaves it hanging, for, for me anyway, and I know that's not going to be everyone's opinion, but for me... If you weren't going to do that, then you shouldn't have had this reaction from him or vice versa, you know, and I get it. Look, they're trying to draw in new fans, too, and firefights help that. It's just a fact that action is going to bring in some new fans, and I'm okay with that, and I'm okay if you want to make it more of an action-y. Just you can't give me, me personally something this profound and just move on from it like that. I'd agree with you. You know, talking about Saru with this constant fear, um, and again, talking about this episode of Pavo and how I have a hard time relating to it, um, in part because I, I'm a white female living in America where all of the systems, for the most part, not perfect, but for the most part, are helping me to be successful. You know, middle class, raised, not perfect life by any way, shape, or form, but the system is in my favor, in part because I'm white. Um, and not to pull the race card, but like I have spoken with so many African Americans who do live within this constant fear of being pulled over, of walking in the wrong neighborhood, of running. For heaven's sakes, if going for a jog, that they're going to be perceived as a threat because of so many of the justice and the way that society is taught and how blacks are perceived and this whole thing around it, that that's sort of the only connection that I can make. And I can't even make it. I have to, you know, view it through this third person of I can see and I know many people who do live in this constant state of fear, especially depending on which city you are living in, you know. Um, and I just, that's my only connection I can make with Saru. I think you bring up something that's very powerful and very profound, Amy. And I don't, I, I think we should explore this. I think that 
if we were to talk to those people that that you've experienced who gave you that information and shared that fear that they have and said, if you could go to a place for just a minute where you could totally be yourself and be free of that, would you do it? I I think that a, some significant percentage of them would say yes. I mean, there might be some other concerns like, you know, well, I have a spouse and, you know, I have a family mm-hmm. and, you know, I have other obligations. I mean, I, I totally get that. But, but just as a pure thought exercise, I think that would be incredibly attractive to a large number of people. And again, I have to point out that that is a very profound Star Trek message teaching mm-hmm. us about humanity by telling us about these other aliens out there. Again, there's lots of Star Trek and Discovery. Don't agree? Come at me, bro. But I, I think that you're totally right. And I think that that was a very good insight. And I totally agree with it. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree with you more. Um, I live in New York. And I, uh, well, what's the best way to put this? I, I'm involved with a lot of groups that, that fight against inequality on a regular basis. And everything you said is true. And as a white male, I can't possibly understand how any of that feels. Yeah, and it's not until... You know, I was getting to know specific people that were explaining it to me and trying to describe, you know, how it is walking on the sidewalk in a predominantly white neighborhood Um, and and seeing arrest reports for literally walking on the wrong side of the road. Like, and I just... Ignorance, you know, I was never taught. I li- grew up in Utah, you know, mostly white. And and so moving around the country and listening to these stories uh, really has opened my eyes. And, and it just sort of relates to what I see with Saru. I have never personally lived in a constant state of fear. And... Talking to other people, I can see that there are people in our wonderful nation that do live in fear constantly. Yeah, absolutely. And a lot of the things they showed in Discovery, I feel, was very on point with things going on today in in the United States. You know, to the point where some people got mad. They thought that they were, that, you know, Discovery was trying to poke fun at certain politicians one way or another because of the way they were acting and uh you know so it, it's not out of the realm of possibility that this was all very intentional to make the exact point you're making and i think star trek has always courted that controversy in a lot of ways mm-hmm. I, I think that that's that's part of the show and i think that's part of the reason that it's become such a such a cultural phenomenon now i want to offer one caveat and you know and it's a it's a little bit of a diversion here but i'd certainly be happy to explore it if you guys Mm -hmm. are willing to but um i was having this discussion with someone on another podcast but here's here's a theory that i'll posit and and i'm happy to have you guys beat me up for it uh given the state of society at the time that the show was on tos pushed the boundary further than discovery has thus far given the starting place of society at the time absolutely agree no i I agree but i think we need to give it another season or two to make a fair assessment of that statement yep i I totally agree i'm saying as we record this at the end of season one given what we know right Mm -hmm. and it could totally change in you know with more episodes you know i totally grant that yeah, I, I agree with you. Yeah, yeah, I definitely think TOS pushed the boundaries more. And I think had TOS been airing today, it would have pissed off a lot more people than it did back then. I That I would agree with. <laughs> so, but, and, and saying that, uh, you know, that is why I love Star Trek. The, the whole pushing social issues is the reason I watch Star Trek. It's not for the gunfights. They're cool. It's not for the space fights. They're cool. But it's, it's for the fact that they will, they will push that envelope and they will make those commentaries and they will, at least to the most part, pick a side, even if they don't fully pick one all the time. Well, you know, I, I've thought a lot about this because, you know, again, this other podcast that I do is, is really more about this. But I, I think that one of the as i've thought about star trek as a whole entity with all the shows one of the things i think that the key lesson is and the key element of star trek fandom is that you have to be an optimist about the future 
and that we're going to be better than where we are today. And what that looks like, we can debate, right? And whether or not it, the Federation is the society that you think we should have, you know, is debatable. But I think you have to believe that that it's going to be better on the other side long term. You know, you could be a short term pessimist, but I, I think that Star Trek at its core is about optimism about the future and a belief in humanity that we're going to sort out our own stuff, which and this is a total aside here. That's why I I actually had a very negative reaction when I found out that Lorca was a mirror universe guy because I was hoping that he would be a prime universe guy so that we could see the story of a guy who was broken, sort himself out and get us to that future that we wanted. And just by making him a mirror universe guy, I felt that it it it, it cheapened the journey and it it lessened what I thought could have been a very powerful story that the Lorcas of the world are going to sort themselves out and we're going to get to a better place. And I, I, I so wanted to see that. And I was disappointed. And I realized we're getting pretty far away from Saru here, yeah. <laughs> but I, I, I just, I, I had to go on a little mini rant there. So I, I apologize to, to Amy and to Patrick and I oh, apologize no. to all the listeners, but I really, um, I really care about this. And I, I really think that that's what Star Trek is at its core. And, and uh, I, I, I'll stop talking now. You guys go. Okay, so no, that's a great segue. Anyway, we can we can we can wrangle this back into uh, Saru because we also see Kelpians on the other side of Mirror Universe, and Saru asks Burnham if there were any other Kel- if there were any Kelpians there. And she lies to his face and says no. How do you feel about the fact that she just so easily lied to him? But it was really to protect his feelings because of they were kind of worse off or do you think they were worse off there than they were even in our universe uh amy so yeah you're asking a couple questions so i'll deal with the first one first because i cannot believe that she would lie just right out i i was astonished that she did so does she not trust that Saru can handle bad news. Like, what is that about? Why is she taking it upon herself to be the protector and to come in and save Saru? He doesn't need saving. He needs the truth. And the truth is what we're founded on. And that's how you build trust. And you're going to lie. And then now you have to worry about the lies, you know, how that goes. And it bites her in the butt later on. And it should have bit her a little harder, in my opinion. But you need to trust the people that you're working with. And for her to just out and out, she could have very easily told him, yes, this is how it is. And I'm sorry. Well, she doesn't even need to be sorry. This is the mirror universe. She needed to tell him up front. He he needs to have the information because what if he were to get captured and then now he's going to get served as stew like he needs to have that information i think this was very very poor judgment and he should have been more upset with her for a lot longer because that was a huge breach of trust in my opinion okay john so amy i completely respect your opinion and i think that it is certainly a valid approach and certainly um uh something that i can tell that that you uh, uh sincerely hold I would say that while I agree that I don't necessarily think that it was correct to withhold the information, I do think it comes from a good place in that she was trying to withhold some information that at the time, again, an error in judgment, that she felt just would have been hurtful to share with him. Uh, But I think it came from a good place, even if she made the wrong decision. Now, having said that, you know, I, and this is, you know, going to be a total uh, black hole here. But when, when I was in college, I took philosophy classes because I thought it would be a cool, trendy thing to do. And I remembered reading a lot of ethics material. And, you know, you study the great philosophers, right? And there was uh, Immanuel Kant. Uh, and his whole theory of ethics was that you have to have maxims, like always tell the truth. And if always tell the truth is a maxim, that means that, you know, if you're in your house and some guy knocks on your door and says, there's a there's a crazy murderer after me and he just wants to kill me for no reason, hide me. And if you hide that person in your house and then the crazy murderer shows up and says, hello, I'd like to kill this person, 
you should tell the truth because that's what always means and say, yes, he's in my living room, you know? So that is a very strict standard. Whereas um, there's lots of other theories like utilitarianism, which is the greatest good for the greatest number. And so under utilitarianism, you can lead to some very bizarre outcomes like killing an innocent person because it leads to the, you know, safety or happiness of other people. And I'm not taking a position on Kantian, uh, on Kantian uh, theory versus utilitarianism, but I think that this is certainly in the spectrum of a gray area. And I respect that she was struggling, uh, Burnham was, with what she thought was the right decision, and she made a judgment call. I think it was the wrong call, but I respect that she was coming from a good place. I'm so, I've just totally lectured there, and y'all should beat me up now. I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> this little segment belongs on Metatrex, but yeah, yeah. we <laughs> love it. <laughs> yeah. So, okay. So, my opinion of the whole thing is, I would have done the exact same thing she did. <gasps> I, I would have. I'm sorry, Amy. I would have lied wow. to your face and said there's no other Amys in the mirror universe, and we're not eating them. So, <laughs> it's just I I couldn't. And there's a few reasons. One, tactically, if he's if he becomes as broken up as she believes he's going to be, he's useless in the mission. He'll never help get him home, right? You need him being focused at that moment. But more importantly, at this point, she does kind of see him not as an adversary, but as more of like that brother-sister relationship. You guys were talking about, how could you tell your brother, no, there's plenty of you guys. I just had you for lunch. Um it, it when, just, when your spouse says to you, does this make me look fat? What's the correct answer? Right. Okay. No, no, no. <laughs> you should you, always tell the truth. No. I, okay. I get what you're saying, John, about always. I, okay. I'll give you that. It's not it, always. But she needed – why did she feel that Saru couldn't handle the truth? Like – does she have that poor of respect for Saru? Like, he's proven himself many times, especially under Lorca. You know, he's well, I don't had know. to... Is it so much that she didn't feel... I know I said that she needs him focused on the mission, right? But I, is that how she felt? Did she feel like he couldn't handle it? Or did she feel like this was unnecessary information that he was never going to find out the truth of? Anyway, I know he does find out the truth eventually. But that he doesn't need to know this because it's only going to hurt him. And no, even if he can handle it, why hurt him? Why should I go out of my way to hurt him at this point? Because... He's a prey in our universe, and there's no difference here. In fact, he's worse off here. And so I'm not going to tell him about his race. Let him find out on his own. I, I have an in-universe explanation, Amy. Are, are, okay. are you game to, to explore okay, this? Okay, I'm okay. listening. Yep. At, at this point in the show, perhaps Burnham is choosing to explore her human side. Whereas a Vulcan would say, I cannot lie, right? And as Spock says in, in Star Trek II, you know, he can only exaggerate, right? I exaggerate. You, you lied. Uh, I exaggerated, right? It's mm -hmm. right out of Star Trek II. And, and when she showed up on the Shenzhou, she was very logical. She was in like full power Vulcan mode. Perhaps at this point, she's choosing to, to explore her humanity and she's choosing to live in the gray a little bit and to live in a more human way of living that is very different in a lot of ways from the pure Vulcan side that she's experienced since she was a child. And so I'm, I'm willing to, to grant that ambiguity in this case. I'm not saying it was right. I'm not saying that it was the correct decision, but I'm willing to say that I understand that she might be willing to explore a little bit at this point. Yeah, I hear you. And when we do a Burnham character dive i will give her that credit but for saru like when you don't give me the full truth you are creating an obstacle for me because at this point they didn't know if they were ever going to return from the mirror universe so at, at that point they are there for the rest of their lives as far as they know so the fact that she's going to withhold important information for him and for his species just it doesn't even make any sense. It's very illogical. So, yes, she had to have been 
working on her human side, very poor timing, I feel, for Saru, because I feel that that is information that he needs to have in order for him to be the most successful if they were to remain in the Mary universe. Okay. Uh, I, like I said, I, I'm not saying I, I said it was the right decision. Yeah, I'm just no, saying I, yeah. I was willing to grant it, you know, that, that maybe she's exploring her human side. And, you know, it's it's okay that sometimes we make wrong decisions. And I think that part of learning to be a human is to realize that, that we live in a very ambiguous, ambiguous, ambi- ambi- ambiguity, mm-hmm. ambigu- ambiguous, ambiguous world. <laughs> ambiguous. <laughs> Thank you, teacher Amy. <laughs> and uh, and so we have to acknowledge that that sometimes we make wrong decisions, which I think that you know uh, step one Burnham would not have been able to do when she first uh, came aboard the Shenzhou. So I, I think it's okay. Although I will point out that how come uh, Saru's threat ganglia didn't come out when she was lying like a lion dog full of lion lies at that point? Right. right? It goes right yeah. back to the threat ganglia. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I did useless. <laughs> so I do give credit for Saru for forgiving Burnham for her mistake there. And he definitely shows a lot of compassion and does understand, oh, you didn't want to hurt my feelings, which that pisses me off. But that's obviously a me thing. Um, <laughs> no, I think it pissed off a lot of people. It just it just didn't piss off the two guys that are on this podcast <laughs> with you. But... <laughs> But, I mean, he is very gracious. He does, uh, you know, try to understand Burnham and her perspective that she didn't want him his feelings to get hurt and blah, 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 that I don't understand. So I will give him credit for being very forgiving and continuing the trusting relationship that he has with her. So I can give a, a semi-reason for why he would be more forgiving of her at that moment. He, he, he came to grips with actually two lies at the exact same moment. When he found out that they were there, he found out that she lied and that Lorca brought him knowing he'd become a slave in dinner. So if I had to choose between two of those people, definitely going to forgive Burnham way faster than I'm going to be okay with what Lorca did to me. Mm, I'm going to disagree with you. Lorca's getting home. Yeah, but he still brought me. I, I'm with Amy. I, 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 I mean, I could be wrong if I'm remembering the show, because as we record this, it's it's the end of May, and I last watched these episodes in first run when they came out in, in the end of 2017 into 2018. But I took it to be that uh, he had no interest in trying to eat Saru. He had no interest no, no, in I don't, trying I don't to mean blow that. up the discovery. He, he, Saru was fine. He wanted them to get home. He just wanted to carry out his evil plot about Mirror Georgia. No, I, I understand that, but that's that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is, at that moment, he found out that there were Kelpians there being served a stew, right? Now, right. I, I, I get it, that... Lorca had no ill will towards Saru in general, but he still brought Saru here well, he brought to dump him off, here. right? But yeah, but everyone else wasn't being served as stew. So in Saru's head, if I'm Saru, I'm looking at this as, well, she lied to me about me being stew, but he lied to me for a heck of a lot longer and brought me here to become stew. It might not be right. It might not be true, but that's what happened. That's what actually physically ended up happening. So I could definitely forgive Burnham way faster than I could forgive... Lorca, who's dead now anyway, but forgive him for bringing me to this place in the first place. But is he? Oh, John. <laughs> <laughs> oh, please. I, he better be. I, he be- I can't I, help it. My, my son does this. He says that to me all the time. I'll say, time to eat your dinner. But is it? You know? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so... Yes, yes. He he better be everyone. Everyone who died better be dead. It, it drive me crazy if people start coming back. Yeah, because you know Spock died in Star Trek too, right? And it, yes, I know. <laughs> Spoiler alert for anyone out there who hasn't seen those movies yet. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry, dude. It's been since like 1986. It's, Someone uh, it's, will it's complain. Time. <laughs> okay, so. I, you have any other thoughts on the, on the whole mirror universe thing? That about covers it, I guess, right? The only thing I'll say about the mirror universe is a general comment, which is I, I take the mirror universe to be like wasabi, a, a little dabble do you too much, and it overpowers the dish. And uh, 
I, I, I like the mirror universe in very small doses. Um, I just felt that discovery season one did way too much. I, I agree. Oh, I did have one more thing to say though, actually. Duh. Um, I think that, cause I said this up, up above that li- we would talk about it later and we don't really see much of the Kelpians, but we see them in the mirror universe and, it feels like the way they're describing the mirror universe now in these two episodes, two, right? It was two, three. How many episodes in Discovery were we in the mirror universe? I think four. Four? four? Okay. Yeah. I guess I fell asleep. Um, a lot. <laughs> so, but what we found out in there is people are a lot closer to their prime, the prime universe and the mirror universe versions of people are a lot closer than we've been led to believe to this point. Now, they might be bad opposed to good but their personalities and everything are kind of very similar and the way the races work are pretty much similar the klingons are the klingons in both universes right but in the prime universe they see holding the klingons together as aligning with themselves with other races whereas in prime universe they find it as not aligning with other races and wanting to be isolationist but the the drive that moves them both towards that are the same. So I think what we do see of Kelpians in this universe is just is an explanation of how they would be if we see them on their planet in the prime universe to a degree. You know, one of the things about the mirror universe that I think that I think it gives us an ability to explore is the nature versus nurture concept. I'm the person that I am. And if I was put into another universe and raised by different people, you know, given the same DNA and genetics and epigenetics, um, special bonus points for knowing what that is, if there's any biologists out there, w- would I be the same person? And I think that that the answer in Star Trek is very clear, which is that there are certain traits that we carry forward, right? So Lorca is a very calculating type dude. And if you read the second uh, Star Trek Discovery novel, which features Prime Lorca. Again, no spoilers, but it features Prime Lorca uh, dealing with a particular issue, and he's very heavily featured in it, um, and he deals with the problem. We see that he has a lot in common with Mirror Universe Lorca. And so that tells us something. And so I think that Star Trek is very clearly, without a doubt, without any ambiguity at all is very much on one side of that debate that that the person you are is the person you are and you have your certain predilections and your certain way of being and even if you're in the mirror universe if you're a certain kind of person you're going to be that way in the mirror universe just with a very different way of acting it out but you're going to be that way if you're a suspicious person you're going to be suspicious if you are a you know bloodthirsty person you're going to be bloodthirsty and it's just very clear that there's a nurture influence on how you display those things, but the person that you are is the same. And it, it seems to me that Star Trek took a vi- Star Trek written broadly took a very strong opinion on that in the show. Yeah, I, I would absolutely agree, um, and that's why I say I think that this does give us some insight to how Kelpians in, in the Prime Universe would would be, because we do see them in a certain way here so they must be very similar in the prime universe yeah and if someone's a a happy-go-lucky person they're going to be a happy-go-lucky person in the in the mirror universe just more about you know killing people but in this universe they're going to be yeah they're going to be more well you you know what i i actually had to talk about this with someone and uh, in another venue and my thought was not that I'm saying that this was intentional, but we never actually got to see the real Captain Kelly. Because sure. if we did see the real Captain Kelly, I get the feeling that it would make us hate Tilly. Probably. Hmm. Because she would be the kind of person who would be like laying waste to like, you know, 30 crewmen at a time on her ship. And, and laughing. You know, and laughing about it and not caring about the fact that she didn't care about it. And I, I think that it would affect the way that we perceive the character. So I, I I think that it was a wise decision to not show us the actual Captain Kelly. Because while I think Mary Wiseman could have acted the hell out of it and done an amazeballs job, 
I I don't think it would have um I, I think it would have had several unintended side effects, which they didn't want. That's a great point. All right. So that's a good interlude, too, into the next section. Uh, what do you think of... So at the end of the season, we see the Discovery flying off the Vulcan, and it's going to pick up its, its captain, its new captain. A lot of people wanted to see Saru take be put into that position. Now, do you think he should have been promoted to captain or do you think he still needs some time to really become a captain uh amy let's start with you oh dear uh yeah i don't see him as captain material quite yet that may change uh if he is put in as captain i'm totally fine with it i really you know these speculations of oh who's it going to be to that I never have really enjoyed doing that. I enjoy oh you're giving me this then let me digest it and internalize it that way and what are the themes and stuff like that. I don't see Saru as captain material. I think um he does have a lot of doubts. I think he is studying. I think he is learning. I think he's becoming and being on his way. Uh, I really like the fact that he, you know, internalizes and says, well, computer, show me all these captains that are the best and what traits do they have and analyze my decision commands and stuff like that. I think that that's great. And I love that aspect about him. Um, but as far as making command decisions, getting the respect of the crew, um, I just it doesn't click for me as what is going to be a Star Trek captain. And I sort of question it in part because we've had Lorca that has been so non-traditional Star Trek captain. I'm wondering, are they going to give us going back to a, you know, quote unquote, Star Trek captain, this typical Picard, Kirk, Cisco, you know, type of character or are they going to mix it up and give us something, again, just totally out of the box like they did with Lorca? I see Saru as the match, not the fire. So I think that he has all the right ingredients. I think that he has – well, maybe right ingredients in the wrong way. But I think that he has the ingredients to be a great captain. Do I think that he's there? No. Um, I think that he has to come to terms with – the Pavo experience, as you brought up, Patrick, and talked very eloquently about. I think that he has to come to terms with that. I think that Saru has the right ingredients, but I don't think it's been all mixed in the in the right proportions. So he could be a great captain. Is he there yet? No. And I will say that part of this is determined by the fact that, you know, I'm a veteran. I, I I was in the Navy. I served under actual captains in the Navy. And I saw what made a great captain. I saw what made a terrible captain. And I saw what made all the captains in between. He's not there yet. And I think that there's a degree of self-awareness which he doesn't yet possess And I think that part of that is, again, analyzing what was so addictive about the Pavans, what was so interesting to him about why he had this conflict with Burnham and really analyzing that, not from an external fan perspective, but from an internal in-universe Saru perspective, that I think that that could really lead to some self-learning and some self-actualization for him. So if I'm looking at, you know, Maslow's hierarchy for all the psychology people out there, he he's not quite at that top level yet. He really needs to do some self analysis to figure out where he is. And he needs a little bit more time. He needs a little bit more time in the toaster to get golden brown all over. Yeah, I don't think I definitely don't think he's ready now. And I don't know if I think he'll ever be ready because I think the fear rules him too much to be a captain a number one a number two great a captain he's just he he relies on the fear too much and that's i mean that's not the worst thing in the world but i don't want that as my captain i don't want that as or i was in the army i don't want that as my lieutenant or my staff sergeant they're just 
if you're too afraid, you hesitate. If you hesitate, you die, and it's not good. And remember, we're still in a war here. I mean, I know it's over, but there's going to be a lot of fallout from this war. When I first became a teacher, um, loved my principal, and he was telling me, so, you know what my job is? And I'm like, well, you're a principal of the school. You have many jobs. And he's like, no, my number one job is to hire the best teachers. And he said, I can look at degrees. I can look at, you know, awards and accomplishments and resumes. He's out. But there is an it factor. And I think it comes into play here with Saru. Like, you know, it's just something that makes a good teacher or makes a good leader. You know, it's that undescribable, you know, you can't really put your finger on it, but you're just going to follow this person. And I don't see that it factor in Saru for being a captain. I I think you're right. You're great first officer, great science officer, um, a, a good follower. But as far as being the leader, the captain, I, I think there's something just not quite either written in his character or the delivery I'm I'm not quite sure I haven't put my finger on it yet. And let me let me cuz I know people are thinking to themselves wait a second about an hour ago this guy just said he loved the speech that rallied the troops. So so before before I I get called for contradicting myself. I absolutely did say that. And it's one thing to lead troops for a mission, an hour, a day. It's another thing to be the captain of the ship day in and day out having to do it. I don't think he's there yet to do it day in, day out. Because when you're just running a, a one mission or a couple days or whatever the case may be, you're still following off of the plans of the captain who left or the person who gave you those orders. You're not doing it yourself. So it's still easier to continue moving forward, even though you're afraid because you're still working off of the premise that you are following orders. I would say it's what I said earlier, which is I think that Saru is the match, not the fire. I think that the raw ingredients are there. And I think that it's a very Star Trek idea to say that here's this person who has these particular challenges that he is a prey animal. He's aware that he's a prey animal. He has these feelings of being a prey animal, but he can choose to think differently about how he evolves and how he makes decisions and how he acts. And while he's not there yet, I think that he could develop into that. And I would agree if Patrick's theory is that he's not there to be the captain now. I would agree with that. He's not there yet. But I think that all the ingredients are there. They just have to be rolled into the burrito and heated appropriately. So do you have any final thoughts on Saru or what are your final thoughts, John? I think that Saru is an interesting mirror. I think that he's well in the line of Spock and Data and maybe Jadzia and T'Pol to, to, to serve as a mirror to humanity. Uh, and as we watch the episodes, I look forward to seeing where he develops. And, you know, as we record this, we're at the end of season one. Um, we don't know what the full story is going to be. I'm optimistic and I'm looking forward to seeing where he goes. But I think that he has the capability to teach us a lot about um, – what we think the future is going to hold and what we think about ourselves. So I'm excited and eager to see what happens. Amy, your final thoughts. Yeah, I'm really glad that we got to deep dive on Saru. Um, I was neither here nor there with him. Um, I wasn't, you know, overly attached or had any strong emotions. Um, but I definitely see his importance on the show uh, his character does bring a lot. We get to see other characters and their re interactions with him and how that develops. And, and I really appreciate how we get to see ourselves in him. And I'm learning to do that more with Saru. I think he does have a good arc. It's going to be very interesting to see if he does develop into a captain. 
uh, where his and Burnham's relationship is going to go, if that's going to go any further, if it's going to go south. I can see it go both ways. I think it's it's uh, they're writing him well and using him well, well, minus the threat ganglia. Um, but, you know, and, and bringing out, again, I love seeing this other race or alien, you know, in Star Trek. That's what I love. And I think that this uh, series is doing is, is, you know, broadening this this franchise and and the story of Star Trek. And, and Saru is just another piece of that, which I love. Patrick, your final thoughts? Yeah. So, uh, all right. So my final thoughts was this was my least liked character um, of the whole show. <gasps> I, I did not like Saru. I know the threat ganglia got me, and it just drove me crazy all season. I'm writing um, your name on my whiteboard as we speak. <laughs> I made the list. <laughs> That's not a good thing. Um, <laughs> no, look, being least liked does not mean I hate you. So yeah, I, people right. are going to just assume that just like my favorite Star Trek is not Discovery. It doesn't mean I hate Discovery, but... He was. There was just too many things about him that, that drove me a little crazy, like his reaction to Burnham and uh, treating her like she caused the war when he should know better. I mean, I understand why everyone else treats her that way, but him, it drove me crazy that he would act that way. The threat ganglia drove me nuts. Um, th- there was a few other things. Whatever, We don't have to get into it, but I will say this, that doing this conversation, having this conversation has opened my eyes to parts of Saru that I do like things that I can at least see going forward that might become something that I can relate to the uh, I, I use the word uh, drug when we were talking about Pavel but before you brought it up I didn't actually think of it as an abuse issue or an addiction issue seeing it that way changes that story a little again that's not his fault it's the writer's fault they never bring it up again and they should have so they should bring it up in the next season if not that's it's just they they missed the boat and they you know they missed a great opportunity but i i guess i really shouldn't blame that on the character since that's really the writing's fault um although i don't know it depends on how you define the character i guess so because people blame the characters for the stuff that's written for them all the time that's what a character is and uh but, I, I mean, I, I like him a little more. He's still probably down there on the list because it, there's just so many great characters in this show. So it, it's hard It's hard for a character that has this many, even if it's just tiny flaws, they add up. And to make his way up the list, you, you still have Lorca and Burnham and Tyler Vogue and Tilly and all these other characters that they're competing with. So, you know, like I said, he was my least favorite. It, it's really not a knock on him. It's, it's more of a... Uh, a nod to the rest and uh, you know I'm just I'm really looking forward to see what they do with him next season because there's so many places for him to grow and there's places for him to fail and I think I could go either way with him doing either or and be happy with it agreed I think that's a profound insight right it's because we're looking at TOS and we're looking at TNG and all the other series because they're completed and we can analyze them and say, here's where we come down, right? But when it comes to discovery, it's still a work in progress. And so I think wherever we stand on the issue of Saru, it's all a matter of what we think is yet to come and and what has happened thus far. And so I think there's room for lots of interpretations uh, as we record this. Oh, absolutely. I mean, look, if they open up the next season and they somehow find a way to fit in the the whole Pavo incident and they fit in him dealing with his fear, you know, in a semi-healthy manner, whatever. He could very quickly shoot up to the, my favorite character. He could. They could also do it in a way that he fails horribly. He could still shoot up to my favorite character because they address those issues. It's just, like you said, we haven't seen it yet. So I can't comment on what I hope they do, only what they do, what they have done. Totally agree. So, but... Thank you, John, for coming on. Where can pe- where can we contact you uh, if people want to see you around the internet? Oh, thank you for asking. So there's probably two different ways I'll offer, uh, which is that I do a podcast, which is uh, called Trek Profiles, which is where we take each episode, we sit down with a Star Trek fan, we lay their fandom out on the table like that Cardassian vole in Mira Lorca's Chamber of Horrors, and we dissect their fandom. And we try to figure out why Star Trek matters to them. 
So if you're interested in that, which is a hundred percent Star Trek all the time, that's at Trek Profiles, and that's also on Facebook or Twitter at Trek Profiles. And if you want to follow my personal account, that's at JKNLV on Twitter. So, but that has a whole bunch of Las Vegas stuff, and lately it's all about Golden Knights because it is the best hockey team of all time, and certainly something which is unassailable. And I will brook no dissent about that because that's how we roll up in here, yo. So if you want to talk to me about uh, my local stuff or anything about myself that's at jknlv on twitter and if you want to talk about trek that's at trek profiles and listeners if you haven't checked out trek profiles you really should john does a fabulous job i love 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 listening to uh all of his questions they're so in-depth they you bring out themes it's so good and you've had so many great people not patting myself on the back but from our own network we had Haley stoddard you had her on uh from truck geeks you had uh bill smith on i was honored to be on your show so you are getting uh just It's so interesting to listen. I'm really, really, listeners, check it out. You will not be disappointed. Well, thank you, Amy. I really appreciate that. And I I tell you, I resisted doing podcasting for a long time uh, only because when people, someone very close to me said, oh, you should do a podcast. And I said, no. Because all the Star Trek podcasts are being done so well. I mean, there's everything you can find on Trek FM. If, If you want a podcast for Star Trek, it's on Trek FM or somewhere else. And there's rewatch podcast, there's news podcast, there's analyst podcast, a- analysis podcast, I should say. And when I was listening to a podcast that had nothing to do with Star Trek at all, and the host said, well, you know, this podcast is about the people. And it suddenly occurred to me that Star Trek is not about the phasers or the ships or the captains or the future. It's about the people. And that's why I chose to do truck profiles. So it was very kind of you to say that. Thank you so much. And if people want to find me, put that into Google, you'll find us. But I, I appreciate that so much. Well, again, thank you for coming on The Edge. And we really enjoyed having you and you offer up a great discussion and it was great having you on. Thank you. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you. It's been fun talking about Saru today, but this isn't the only thing we've been discussing on the network. So here's a quick look at some of the other things you may have missed elsewhere on Trek FM. Previously on Trek.FM. To the journey! Do you have to have the stick to be the grand proxy? The scepter? Yeah. I see it as a walking <laughs> stick. <laughs> um, is that supposed to be the grand negus's um, scepter? Or is that the actual one? Or oh my that's a gosh. replica, of course, but is it supposed to be the actual one? I don't know, but what it reminds me of totally is old Biff from Back to the Future, old Biff, <laughs> yes. with his his cane that he hits people on the head with. That is totally it. Hello! <laughs> McFly! Think McFly, think. Standard Orbit. People are coming over and they're introducing people to him, and it's my turn. And he goes, Steve, uh, Jim, uh, Jimmy, I want you to meet the, the host of the convention. This is Stephen Lance. And he goes, Please to meet you, sir. Nice to meet you, Mr. Dewan. And he goes, Hi, Steve. Nice to meet you. And he's like, What? What? <laughs> you, mean, you mean you don't talk like that? The 602 Club. In particular, I noticed that the most with either Elastigirl or Violet, because it's sort of like you and I were talking about before the show, it, Helen, Elastigirl, really shows that she's Elastigirl not only in what she does as a superhero, but in showing the things that a regular mom has to deal with, you know, whether you're a single mom or, you know, a a big family, it's something that um, traditionally they're trying to show that um, a a parent goes through. Warp 5. Right, because Frankenstein himself like it doesn't really mistreat the monster right they've got him locked up chained up and whatnot right because he's they don't know what to do with him i guess like now that i've made this corpse well now what right like like yeah. you know it's not like a puppy never right? thinking like, about the end game just like all those you know master villains it's like yeah you uh, you rule the world and then what right and that's what else is happening on trek.fm Check out all of these shows and join the conversation about your favorite corner of the Star Trek universe and beyond. You'll find us wherever you get your podcasts. 
If you're an Apple user, be sure to hit the subscribe button in Apple Podcasts on iPhone, iPad, or Apple TV, or the desktop iTunes app to get the latest episodes as soon as they are published. And please leave us a star rating and written review. That helps others to find our lovely show. If you're not an Apple user, we've got you covered as well. You can find our shows on Google Play Music, Stitcher, TuneIn, Spreaker, SoundCloud, Windows Phone, in most third-party apps, and you can stream and download the MP3 file from our website or grab the RSS link. We'd love to hear your thoughts on today's show, and there are many ways for you to do that. The best place to join in the larger conversation is the Babel Conference. That's our listeners group on Facebook. Just type Babel, B-A-B-E-L, into the search field on Facebook, and it should come right up. And now, if you'd like to send us an email, we love getting those, you can use the form on our website at trek.fm slash contact. Choose to send to a show and select the edge that will come right to us. You can also find the network on Twitter at trek.fm and on Facebook at facebook.com slash trek.fm. So, Patrick, where can people find you when you're not sensing fear? Well, when I'm not sensing fear, they can they can find me over at the Babel Conference. I pop my head in and out of there. I'm also on Twitter, well, Magic Drop Five. The it's one word, but the five is a number. And they can always find me over on Warp Five with my with my good buddies uh, Brandy and Brandon. So, Emperor Amy, when where can people find you when you're not preparing Kelpie and stew? Well, my favorite of dishes, of course. Um, You can find me here on the network. I do a little uh, TNG podcast with Justin and Richard called Earl Grey. Uh, You can find me on Twitter at Miss Amy Nelson. And you can find me on the Babel Conference because that's my favorite place to be. If you'd like to help us keep all of our shows coming to you each week you can become a patron of the network on patreon visit patreon.com slash trek fm that's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash trek fm to get all the details perks include early access to episodes exclusive content producer credits and more available through our special patrons website patron zone it requires a great deal of money to produce host and distribute these shows each month especially getting them out to the mirror universe we really appreciate any support you can give us and hope you'll join the team again you'll find all the details at patreon.com slash trek fm we'd like to thank our associate producers they are norman lau tony robinson thomas puleo lisa slack Shoab mercer richard rutledge james muldrow and cornelia reutner thank you so much for supporting trek fm and especially the edge thank you for listening and join us next time to see what's happening on the edge of Federation Space. Amy, may I ask you a question? Yeah. So, Discovery's not over. We've just reached the end of Season 1, so there's, there's more to be done. But TNG is done. Do you envision a trajectory for Discovery where it could surpass TNG as your favorite Star Trek? And I'm not asking you to commit. I'm just saying, do you think it's possible? Oh, John. That, that's uh, how we do up in here, yo. I, I don't see a trajectory where it becomes her favorite show. <laughs> well, <clears throat> John, you've, you've known me just so little. Um, <laughs> and my love of TNG runs deep. I do not foresee, and I could be wrong, So, but I really do not foresee anything taking the place of my number one spot of next oh, Only generation. a Sith deals in absolutes. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> now we're crossing streams. <laughs> so I, I could, I will leave the door open ever so slightly. But as of right now, it's still TNG.